One of the most successful things the WWE ever put together was the Royal Rumble match. The annual Royal Rumble has always been one of my personal favourite matches of the year thanks to the many surprise entrants we usually get and also, I like how it gives us some early insight into who the WWE want to push as we head into WrestleMania. There have been some bad Rumble matches too though, and there's also been some questionable choices for Royal Rumble winners, but it's still a fun match every year. Pat Patterson has been given credit as the man who came up with the concept, a standard battle royal where the competitors would have staggered entrances, and it's those staggered entrances that make it way more exciting. Battle royals were nothing new, but having wrestlers enter the match every two minutes or so gave the audience a reason to keep cheering throughout the contest. WCW also had an annual over the top rope battle royal, the World War 3 match. In a World War 3 match, 60 competitors are spread out over 3 rings with the final competitors moving into a single ring at the end of the bout, although these rules could change ever so slightly. The World War match always had 3 rings and 60 superstars though, and I remember hearing about these matches and desperately wanting to see them. In the UK, we struggled to get WCW pay per views in the mid to late 90s. You'd have to know a guy who knew a guy who could copy a VHS tape. It could be weeks or even months before you got to see a certain pay per view, and I remember waiting forever to finally see a bad copy of World War 3 1995. Imagine trying to watch a World War 3 match with those tiny boxes on the screen while also dealing with a poor quality VHS tape where the source was already copied about three times over. Needless to say, I was a bit disappointed when I watched the show. I built it up in my mind to be this colossal war. I mean, three rings, 60 superstars, there was no way it could have been bad, but it was just so difficult to watch. Even watching the WWE Network uploads of World War 3 isn't a great experience either. With that many guys in three separate rings, you just don't get to see everything that happens. You miss the majority of eliminations, and it only really gets good towards the final moments of the bout. Add in the fact that World War 3 1995 had a typical Hulk Hogan finish where he lost, but he didn't really lose, and yeah, I just didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. The WWF's Royal Rumble matches remained king of the battle royals. On the October 18th, 2000 episode of WCW Thunder held in Melbourne, Australia, World Championship Wrestling decided to put on what was essentially a standard WWF Royal Rumble match, known as the Countdown to Armageddon. 29 superstars competed in an over the top battle royal where entrances were staggered and the winner would get a WCW title opportunity on a future episode of Nitro. The commentator said this was a 30 man battle royal, but there were only 29 entrants. With the match being held on Thunder and the title shot taking place on Nitro, clearly this wasn't going to be as extravagant as the World Wrestling Federation's Royal Rumble and the winner getting a title shot at WrestleMania, so you go into this one with your expectations in check. Wrestlers come into the match every 30 seconds, and you've got a mix of lower card guys, mid card guys and main eventers taking part in the match. Booker T was the WCW champion at the time, and the winner would get to face Booker T on the October 30th episode of Monday Nitro, the night after Halloween Havoc 2000. This all took place during Vince Russo's final days as head writer at WCW, and there's really nothing more to say in terms of why this was booked or the story behind the match. WCW was in Australia, so they booked a unique match for the last televised show of the tour, and booking a Royal Rumble style matchup was just another poor last ditch effort to try and make people tune into WCW television. The problem here is that the Countdown to Armageddon match was not promoted at all before this episode of Thunder, and another glaring problem is that the Countdown to Armageddon match was absolutely awful and instantly forgettable. This is me taking one for the team here guys, I've watched this to spare you the misery. Let me tell you what happens. Alright, so let's see WCW's attempt at a Royal Rumble match, the match that took place on a WCW B-Show. 
Entrant number one, above average Mike Sanders of the Natural Born Thrillers. Entrant number two, Ernest Miller. These two were in a rivalry of sorts over who would be the WCW commissioner, but there's no time to talk about that. Entrant number three is already on their way to the ring, Sean Stasiak of the Natural Born Thrillers, so the kid is at an immediate disadvantage. Entrant number four, you guessed it, the Natural Born Thrillers Chuck Palumbo. Names were apparently drawn at random too guys, what are the chances of this happening? You'd think this was predetermined. Sean Stasiak was having some problems within the natural born thrillers, he was named the black sheep of the group, and so Miller gets a bit of a break when Palumbo and Stasiak begin pushing each other around. But again, no time to talk about that, entrant number 5 is Disco Inferno, or just Disco as he was officially known back then. This was back when Disco was teaming up with Alex Wright and the Boogie Knights tag team, so what are the chances of Alex coming out as entrant number 6? In reality, very slim, in WCW 2000, extremely high. Alex Wright is out next and Tony Schiavone reminds fans that the entrants are all determined by a random draw. Mark Madden says the Cat and Mike Sanders were in charge of the draw, so there could have been some messing around with the entrance orders. But then, why on earth would they draw themselves as number one and number two? The answer to this, according to Stevie Ray, is because they hate each other. I don't get it. Crowbar is out next. Mark Madden compares Crowbar to a psychotic gas station attendant and when Tony Schiavone concurs, Stevie Ray tells Tony not to make fun of gas station attendants. What the fuck's going on? Ron Harris is entrant number 8. He completely cleans house once he steps into the ring and take a wild guess who comes out next. Yep, entrant 9 is Don Harris or Heavy D as he's known here, Heavy Dick. Giovanni says that Heavy D is the 8th entrant by the way, so even the commentators couldn't have cared less about this matchup. And why would they? Stevie Ray is absolutely blown away by the fact that Don Harris rolled into the ring. Heavy D just rolled in the ring! He, sure he, he rolled in the ring! Off. He rolled in the ring, Tony! Rolled in the ring! Tony, no one and at number 10 we have Turncoat Jim Duggan, a member of Team Canada. We've had no elimination so far either. At number 11 we have Chavo Guerrero and Chavo shows Heavy D how it's done when getting into the ring. I'm surprised Stevie Ray's head didn't explode when Chavo got inside the ropes. At number 12 we have Kevin Nash and Big Sexy gets a great crowd reaction when the Wolfpack music plays in the arena. Like oh wait a minute! Oh yeah! Oh yeah coach! Thunder then takes a commercial break right in the middle of Nash's entrance. Being a taped show we don't miss any of the action, lucky us. We see our first eliminations when Nash eliminates Chavo and Duggan, Ernest Miller then eliminates Mike Sanders, and immediately afterwards Nash eliminates Miller. The Boogie Knights then eliminate Crowbar as entrant number 13 makes his way down to the ring, David Flair. Nash eliminates Disco and Wright just as David hits the ring. Wait a minute, pardon my interruption, the chiseled Adonis will take it from here. Tony Schiavone, give me that headset and ain't nobody talking while I'm talking, so shut the hell up. You Mark Madden and you Stevie Ray, you move your little lips, I'll beat the hell out of you. Maybe not you Stevie Ray. Raise the roof, haul them heat baby. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Countdown to Armageddon. Is that Jake Paul or is it David Flair? The resemblance is uncanny, but his controller would begin to glitch as he would emote upon his entrance into the ring. The malfunctions would continue as his character indicator would now drop. He'd have to unplug his entire console and reset and respawn in the corner. Meanwhile, across the ring, the perfect event tag team appear to be having a fallout between Chuck Palumbo and Sean Stasiak. And Kevin Nash appears to be completely disinterested. Palumbo would assault Oxygen, but then Stasiak would hit him with a right hand that sends him over the top rope. But rather than engage Kevin Nash, Sean Stasiak remembers he left the meat in the freezer. Flair would finally engage Nash, but he never read his father's ebook on how to deliver a knife edge chop. He's unaffected by the finger poke of doom, but Nash would throw him out of the ring anyway. There's a lot to unpack here. David Flair looking like he got a lab coat from Dr. Kurt Connors straight out of the Marvel Universe. And then he'd proceed to bust out moves you can only achieve when you blow a 6.8 on a breathalyzer. I mean, my God, with dance moves this bad, he makes Brodus Clay and the Great Khali look like Michael Jackson. At this very point, David Flair looks as if he just got through in a booking meeting between Jim Hurd and Vince Russo. He don't got a clue what's going on. 
Palumbo's confused, Stasiak's confused, Nash is confused, Flair's confused, we're all confused. Suddenly, it looks like Big Sexy's having a flashback to WrestleMania 11. He started looking for Pamela Anderson ringside only to watch Palumbo get eliminated. Stasiak's right hand must be more devastating than the Big Show's WMD. Palumbo went flying, and the recoil sent Stasiak out the other end of the ring. And in conclusion, Flair is moving like a faulty Wi-Fi connection, and rather than reboot the system, Nash would throw the entire a router out of the ring what did we just see? i don't know and you can find me on youtube at chiseled adonis big shout out to wrestling bios for having me on make sure you check out chiseled adonis on youtube guys i promise you won't be disappointed okay so the harris brothers got thrown out of the ring and lash larue entered the ring as david flair got eliminated after taking a big boot, the Raging Cajun gets thrown over the top rope and why does it look like he's performing a plancha to the outside? We're at the point of no return now guys, we have to keep going as bad as this is. Entrant number 15 is Kiwi, and the guys in the truck forget to play his entrance music so we get a little drum sample instead. Paisley! He should have came by himself! I got a feeling he'll be joining on the outside. A clothesline does the job here. Kiwi gets eliminated after getting clotheslined by Nash. And Big Kevin now has a solid 5 seconds all to himself before our next competitors hit the ring. The giant killer Rey Mysterio comes out next and Nash takes a springboard dropkick. Rey tries to go on offense but a big boot to Rey's shoulder sends Mysterio to the mat. Not sure if Nash was aiming for the head here but well. At number 17 we have Booker T. Yes. Booker T, WCW Champion Booker T. If he wins tonight, he wrestles himself at a future date. To be fair, he could lose the WCW Championship at Halloween Havoc and this win could be his insurance policy, so let's give it a pass. Booker T and Rey Mysterio take turns at attacking Nash before number 18 hits the ring, Mike Awesome. Mike goes after Nash too, we have a 3 on 1 situation here but Nash still manages to take care of the opposition. Sting easily gets the best pop of the whole match when he comes out at entrant number 19. Kevin Nash takes two stinger splashes, Ray hits another springboard dropkick, and Kevin Nash gets eliminated by Booker, Sting and Ray just as the next competitor comes to the ring. The chosen one, Jeff Jarrett. Before Double J gets to the ring, Scott Steiner shows up. Apparently he's an entrant too and the commentators explain that Big Papa Pump simply didn't want to wait until his turn. Big Nash sits on the outside wondering what the hell is going on, trying to piece together this absolute mess inside the ring, and then Sting eliminates both himself and Double J with a clothesline over the top. Mike Awesome and Rey Mysterio then eliminate Steiner and Booker T, so we have two men left in the ring. Entrant number... Oh fuck, I'm confused now, hold on. Um, yes, entrant number 22 is Billy Kidman, we'll count Steiner as 21. Mysterio and Kidman of the Filthy Animals go to work on Mike Awesome for a few seconds and our next entrant is Team Canada leader Lance Storm. Lance saves Mike Awesome from getting eliminated and Rey Mysterio almost goes over the top rope but he stays in the match. Number 24 is Big Vito. We have 5 competitors inside the ring as the commentators say they have completely lost count of the entrants. Mark Madden wants to know what number we are currently on and nobody has a clue. Out next is Sean O'Hare of the Natural Born Thrillers and, naturally, the next entrant, number 26, is Mark Jindrak. There's no eliminations before the next competitor hits the ring, Conan. So we have a Filthy Animals vs Natural Born Thrillers fight in the middle of this illustrious countdown to Armageddon match. Numbers 28 and 29 come out together, it's the Chronic Tag Team featuring Brian Adams and Brian Clark. And these two will be our final entrants in the match. Kidman hits a rough looking Hurricane Rana on Adams and Adams decides to eliminate Billy immediately afterwards. Conan then accidentally eliminates Rey Mysterio and this leads to Brian Clark eliminating K-Dog. Mike Awesome then eliminates Lance Storm and honestly I'm not trying to rush through this match either, all these eliminations are happening so fast. Chronic then work together to eliminate Big Vito and then Clark and Adams join forces with Jindrak and O'Hare to beat up Mike Awesome. Awesome takes a pile driver from Brian Adams that looked like it could have gone horribly wrong. And just as Awesome was about to get eliminated, Goldberg hits the ring. Keep in mind that Goldberg is not an entrant in this battle royal. He was attacked earlier in the show by Chronic, and he's also got a match against Clark and Adams at Halloween Havoc. So it looks like Goldberg was out to get a little revenge. 
Goldberg takes out Jindrak and O'Hare before having problems with Chronic. Jindrak accidentally eliminates himself and O'Hare after Mike Awesome dodged the clothesline attempt, and Goldberg is then able to hit a spear on Brian Clark. Goldberg, for whatever reason, is allowed to eliminate Clark as Adams grabs a chair. Mike Awesome saves Goldberg from taking a chair shot, and we see another spear. We then think Awesome's gonna nail Goldberg with the chair, but the two men join forces and Brian Adams gets sent over the top rope. The bell rings and that 70s guy Mike Awesome is named the winner of the Battle Royal. Thunder goes off the air immediately after the match and that's it. WCW's attempt at a Battle Royal style match that even the most diehard WCW fans have to admit was absolutely abysmal. Let's take a quick look at what happened during Mike's title shot then, we might as well get some closure here. At Halloween Havoc 2000, Scott Steiner got disqualified during his WCW title match against Booker T, meaning Booker was still WCW champion on the October 30th episode of Nitro. Steiner intimidates Commissioner Mike Sanders at the beginning of Nitro and he demands a title shot. Only problem here is that Mike Awesome had earned himself a title shot tonight back in the Countdown to Armageddon match. It's decided that the main event of Monday Nitro would be a triple threat match, Booker T defending against Steiner and Awesome. Both Booker and Awesome felt that Steiner bullied his way into this match and they said they had worked together to take out Big Papa Pump, but of course that didn't last long. Booker T wins the triple threat match, Booker's feud with Scotty Steiner would continue. And as for Mike Awesome, well Booker granted Awesome another title shot on the 8th of November episode of WCW Thunder, and the match actually wasn't all that bad considering this era of WCW and this era of the Thunder program. Booker T wins again, and Mike Awesome wouldn't get another shot at the WCW Championship. The countdown to Armageddon match then ends up as more of a curiosity than anything else. The WCW Royal Rumble match that took place while the company itself was slowly going down the toilet. It's booked really strangely, with main eventers being placed right in the middle of the match, sandwiched between mid and lower card superstars, and the outcome, in the end, meant absolutely nothing on the grand scheme of things. It doesn't come recommended at all, it's way too fast paced, it never settles down, the commentary team dismissed the match as it's happening, guys coming into the match when they please, limited in ring action, bad wrestlers, bad booking, it's an absolute mess that, in a way, sums up exactly what made WCW what it was in late 2000. Think about your least favourite Royal Rumble match, well, Countdown to Armageddon is at least 10 times worse. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this one guys and I'll see you all next time. Once again, a big shout out to Chiseled Adonis for appearing on the show and thank you for supporting the channel. A few other guys who support the channel as Hall of Famers over on Patreon are Simon and Bryce. Thanks for helping Wrestling Bio stay consistent with three uploads every week. Early videos, exclusive videos, ad free videos and the theme music remixes that you hear on this channel are available for supporters. If you want to see what's on offer then head over to Patreon and have a look. Again, a big thanks to Adonis, Simon and Bryce and everyone else who helps out with wrestling bios.